Hey everybody, Sean Tanner here from theautomationblog.com and in this episode of The Automation Podcast, I sit down with Bob Drexel to get an overview of IFM's real-time maintenance condition monitoring products. Bob, thanks for coming on The Automation Podcast today. I'm really looking forward to learning about your real-time maintenance products. And uh, before we begin, can you tell our audience uh, what your role is at IFM? Yeah, Sean, thanks for inviting me today. Um, yeah, I'm Bob Drexel. I'm the product manager here at IFM for our real-time maintenance products um, and for our solutions for bringing vibration measurements to automation equipment. With that said, let's dive right in. What do you have to teach us about today? Yeah, so I, I think uh, real-time maintenance, um, the acronym RTM, um, it's a topic in nearly every company that uh, produces products, right? So some kind of manufacturing. Whether it's that they're planning to do something or they're starting to implement something, real-time maintenance um, is becoming the next generation of um, systems within manufacturing. And um, the reason behind it, the why behind it, is because in this day and age, equipment always has to be available when, when needed. You can't operate in this competitive environment, this global environment any longer, where you can disrupt your schedule, your product flow, um, your sh shipments. So it has to be available when it's scheduled and needed. And you can't um, compromise production time. It's just not allowed anymore. And um, the real thing is that technology has changed, and now the technology is available for equipment to tell us when it needs maintenance. Can you explain to me what the difference is between what I would have classically called condition monitoring and what you're referring to as real-time maintenance? Really, I think that uh, you can break maintenance activities down into three different categories. And the first one, which is what probably most people in their own lives kind of operate on, is what we call reactive maintenance. Reactive maintenance basically is you run the equipment until it breaks. Um, this is the most expensive way because usually when equipment breaks, because you let it run to failure, that means other things were damaged along with what caused the failure. Um, you disrupt your machine availability, you disrupt your production capabilities. And so reactive maintenance is the easiest to structure, but the most costly um, to, to, to have to live with, right? The type of maintenance that most professional organizations operate on is preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance is very good at keeping the equipment running, but the downside to preventative maintenance is that whenever you're doing something on a chronological time frame, you're not taking into consideration the actual use of that machine. So what happens is you're replacing components, wear components, you're um, changing lubrication prematurely, and you're not getting the most of the life out of those consumable components in a maintenance process that allows you to optimize your costs. And the newest technology, which is what we're talking about today, is being able to predict the, um, the necessary things that a machine will need to keep it in good operating condition. And this then maximizes the usage of your consumables, it maximizes the usability and the um, lengths between maintenance cycles, and it minimizes the labor costs, which are a big component of maintenance. Um, it minimizes those costs so that you have the optimal level between machine availability and the costs associated with keeping the equipment running. And so if we look at technologies for real-time maintenance um, and predictive maintenance models, the most common technologies are um, the equipment used for 
determining if lubricating or um, power transfer oils are in good operating conditions, right? So you have hydraulic systems which create force for motion. You have oil systems for lubricating rotating components and real-time maintenance um, equipment will have particle counting, oil, uh, moisture level measurements. These are all to make sure that the fluids are clean and capable of um, their task within the machine without causing any damage or, hard, or harm to the machine. Another very common technology is temperature measurement, whether it's a direct um, RTD measurement or thermocouple, which is, let's say, looking at the temperatures of windings in a motor, or if it's using infrared technology to look at structures, looking at the machine and see if there's hot spots or electrical circuits. Um, temperature measurement is very versatile for a lot of ways that it can be used for predictive maintenance. And the last primary category is vibration monitoring. Um, whether it's in the ultrasound range, which is really great at finding things like air leaks or lubrication issues, basically ultrasound looks for turbulence and there can be applied in a lot of different ways. Um, then there's accelerometer-based technologies, which um, are the core of what vibration monitoring has been. And we're gonna focus on the accelerometer-based type vibration measurements today. So why vibration monitoring? What's the big strength that it brings for a real-time maintenance program? Well, I like this chart here that I'm showing because it kind of steps you through the phases of from a piece of equi equipment being new or recently serviced to end of life. And vibration is the first indicator which can be measured that allows for understanding if there's any kind of faults um, conditions happening within a machine that will cause damage. Um, vibration gives you the longest um, time period to react. Vibration measurements will then manifest themselves as audible noise, right? Once you have audible noise, it goes very quickly from being, oh, I hear something wrong to the machine is broken. Um, in between noise and broken, usually then you start to see heat, right? That's where temperature measurement, but it's really late in the um, cycle. Before you have noise or when you have noise and when you have heat, you already have damage to that machine. And so vibration monitoring gives you the ability to minimize the amount of damage that's happened to a machine. And that ultimately means the machine can be fixed, um, planned, and the least amount of cost to fix it. And so if we look at the different type of vibration monitoring equipment out there, um, there's a couple different concepts and a couple different methods that are traditionally used. The first one, and that's the image I have there on the top, um, handheld sensors. These are really simple. Basically, they take a single, what's called broadband measurement. Um, it's a very wide range of vibration frequencies. Um, and you take the sensor, you press it up against the machine, you press a button, it gives you a reading. Um, the main issue with this is one, repeatability, and two, what can you really tell from that broadband measurement? The next um, type of equipment, and this has really been the core of vibration measurement technology for quite a while and has really always been the methodology which has made actionable information from vibration measuring very successful, is the handheld route recorder. Um, these are really powerful um, for analyzing the different frequencies of interest. The big problem that they face now is two things. One is it's a periodic check, maybe once a quarter. And so it's only a small snapshot and 
a lot can happen to your machine in between those periodic measurements. And the second thing, it's labor intensive. It's high cost from labor. You need to have an employee who understands the equipment, go make the measurements, and then you need usually someone else who is the vibration analyst to make sense of the information. And so it's just not feasible in today's um, manufacturing space to have that kind of dedicated resource to carry out um, vibration measurements. And honestly, it's not needed anymore with the state of the equipment that we have and the ability to have computerization and ethernet networking and so forth. The last technology is these dedicated protection systems. These are usually used on very expensive capital equipment like a gas turbine. Um, they're very complicated. They take a lot of knowledge to implement, to use. It's really an expert system and it's just not cost effective for the typical balance of plant equipment such as a centrifugal pump or maybe even something like a machine tool. And so with the different types of technology out there, it really comes down to applying it to the application. There's different methods and different machines you can utilize um, from very simple or maybe to more complex um, technologies. And so you have to differentiate between these different types of applications. And so what IFM has done to try to simplify um, utilizing real-time maintenance technologies to the average guy, right? Um, we've developed a way to classify machines and we classify them as type one, type two, and type three machines. Type one machines are simple machines and they're dominated by what we call C forces, construction forces, and we'll get a little bit more into that um, as we progress in the presentation. Um, type two machines, are also simple machines, but they're dominated by process forces. And then type three machines are complex machines dominated by both the construction forces and the process forces. And the images on the bottom kind of step through. Um, electric motor is a type one machine. A ducted fan is a type one machine. When you come into multi-stage machines, then you start getting into type two machines and then complex machines such as machine tools, mill, um, CNC milling machines. These are very complex from their construction forces and their process forces. And so let's take a look at the different types of forces that different applications um, produce, right? So the first is construction-based forces. By that we mean it's the construction of the machine. So it's got um, gearing, it has belting, it has various different things which um, are its construction. And each one of those features in a machine will cause vibration as those components um, degrade, right? So examples are like unbalance or gear mesh or a pump or fan blade pass, um, commutator pass or rotor pass in a motor. These are all construction constraints which can be identified by a specific frequency of vibration. The next is process-based forces. Um, these are the work that the machine does, right? So these are the dynamic forces of what the purpose of this machine is. So um, examples of process forces is like in the picture I'm showing the grinding action. The grinding action is very violent and is the noisiest in this process of this grinding wheel spinning and this um, machine tool table moving um, to create the parts of the right size. So examples are like forming from a press or cutting in a milling machine, grinding as we just talked about, even moving and or separating um, can make a lot of process noise. And then the last is fault-based forces. 
this is what occurs when you combine the construction forces and the process forces. This man, the fault-based forces is the manifestation of those two. It's the machine doing its work and operating its components and wearing out. And that manifests itself as a fault-based force. And so some examples are, you know, the machine is being loaded heavily, so it may have a misalignment between its um, motor and gearbox. Um, the, the ball bearings in the, in the machine will start to wear and clearances open, um, which gives then um, mechanical looseness. Um, belts get damaged um, in pumps and things like that you'll start to have cavitation maybe because there's a seal leak. And so if we relate these um, forces back to machines where we started, type one machines, simple machines, here, and that's this chart that you can try to sh uh, see to visualize the vibration patterns within a machine. Uh, simple machines, the um, process forces are relatively low, right? They're usually quite quiet. And in the example I show here is a centrifugal pump. If you spin that pump, um, there's really no noise happening. It should be very balanced. It should be very smooth running. And the fluid moving through it should be very low in turbulence. And so the loudest vibration sy signals will come from construction forces and fault forces. And it's like, so like a couple of examples in a pump, construction forces would be an unbalanced situation where the process forces would be flow noise, right? Cavitation. And fault forces would manifest themselves in bearing damage or alignment, um, could also be cavitation because of a seal leak. In type two machines, here they can be simple machines, but the work they perform, um, it has high process forces. So a great example is something like a hammer mill, right? So the machine itself and its construction forces and fault forces can be very quiet, but the work the machine performs overshadows it. It's so much louder that it's hard to identify any of the other faults. So for these kind of machines, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, things like doing a reference run become important. And by reference run, I mean maybe first thing in the morning or first shift, the machine is run without doing the process material in a hammer mill. The material going in isn't fed in and the machine kind of free spins. And then you can listen for the construction forces and fault forces. Maybe that happens once a shift, or maybe it happens between batches. This is all part of the concept of the process, which needs to be integrated to create your real-time um, measurements and maintenance. And then there's the type three machines. These are the complex machines. These are where construction forces and process forces are always present, even if the machine is idling. And here now, um, it's important to be able to isolate specific frequencies of interest. Basically, it's filtering out the noises of the process and the construction to look specifically for those fault forces. And here's where you need to have high frequency resolution, you need to be able to uh, measure specific, what we call narrow bands. So that would be like a very specific frequency. Um, a good example of that is um, with rotating equipment, the rotating speed. You can see a lot of what's going on with the machine if you look at the rotational speed, because it's an indicator of any kind of lost energy because the machine is working hard, let's say, an unbalanced situation is a classic one. Um, and so you need to then utilize a technology that gives you this higher level to separate and filter. Um, you can't rely on broadband measurements like on type one and type two machines. And so now with a view to the types of machines and the types of vibration patterns which are created, 
it makes more sense why you have um, a variety of different technologies which can be employed. So you can always use a very complex measurement system for simple things, but it may not always be what's necessary. Usually then there's higher cost. And for a type one machine, you can do it very easily and simply with a low cost product and a low technology product that's easy to implement. And so from IFM, we offer a variety of different um, solutions to match the type of machine. So simple single measurement broadband switches and transmitters are great. They're kind of, they're plug and play. They're, they're really easy. There's not a lot of knowledge necessary and they're really effective for type one machines. Then there's multiple measurement switches and transmitters. These give you the additional option to be able to bring in another sensing principle, very common is temperature measurement. So now you would be able to outfit a machine with vibration measurements and temperature measurements and get a better picture of what's going on with that machine. Many machines have um, some kind of cooling system, right? So temperature measurement is ideal for monitoring that the cooling heat exchanger system is operating correctly because if it's not, that will cause mechanical damage, which will then be um, detected by vibration. So it gives a better capability to outfitting type one and type two machines. The next category then really starts to leverage the latest technology of digital communication. IFM offers a wide variety of IO-Link sensors that can be networked together, together to make a really comprehensive solution. Um, the advantage of digital communication means that from a single sensor with a single cable, you can get many different measurements. And so with our digital communication vibration sensor, we're measuring multiple different types of measurements becoming more and more narrow band. So we're measuring velocity, we're measuring the average acceleration, we're measuring the peak acceleration. These all give better def definition to the um, what's going on in a machine and allow better understanding of what a root cause could be. And the last category then is um, fully programmable edge controllers. Um, these devices are um, necessary whenever you start to look at a type three machine. Um, they can also do type two and type one. Um, there might be some advantage to the having a common platform within your facility. You only need to learn one technology, um, but they're really geared towards um, definitive root cause information about the operating condition of a piece of equipment. So today we're gonna focus on the edge controllers and really the major advantage of the edge controller is two things. One is you can create a digital twin of the kinematics of a machine and you can calculate that all at the edge. That's an important point because getting actionable information and simplifying the automation and network resources are critical to any kind of mass deployment of a technology. If you need to um, stream a vibration raw signal from a hundred pieces of equipment in your plant and bring it to a central location, the networking of that becomes um, enormous um, from bandwidth associated. So it's really not a, a, a methodology that can be employed in large scale. And edge processing is a necessity for any kind of high level calculations to be able to make sense of the measurement signals. So I mentioned a digital twin kinematic model, right? What does that mean? Um, people think of digital twins and you've got a representation in a computer and you can do different things with it. From IFM's point of view for real-time maintenance, a digital twin of the kinematics means that I can describe the frequencies of, that are occurring on this machine 
in specific detail. And I, I have a video or an animation, I should say, which tries to visualize what this means by a kinematic model. And here you can see in the model, we have a complex blower system. And the graph on the left is showing as the unbalance of the blower starts to happen and that the rotors start to no longer run concentric, the balance um, starts to tick, unbalance starts to tick up, the bearings start to um, create wear, and the whole system starts to vibrate. This can be all described in a digital twin model looking at the specific frequencies, the kinematics of this system and this machine. And so an example from what kind of measurements can be made in a digital twin kinematic model. Um, things like the rotating shaft. So in the um, animation I just showed, the shaft of the motor, the shaft of the multi-stage blower, um, you can monitor the specific rotational speed and you can tell if there's any kind of unbalanced situation happening, um, especially with um, fans and blowers that move air, they collect dirt and debris, unbalance is one of the major issues that cause them to fail. You can also then look at the coupling between the power source and the device. Um, we call this misalignment. Basically, you're going to look at the rotational speed and some of the harmonics, and this is the indicator which is saying there's a misalignment system within this mechanical device. Um, other things like looking at two times the electric line frequency, so uh, here in the US it's 60 hertz, right? Looking at 120 hertz, you can pick up electrical issues with the windings in an electric motor. Um, gears, gear mesh frequencies, these are um, very easily calculated and you can actually look at the frequency of the teeth meshing and as they wear, you see changes in that mesh, which are a signal that there's wear and maybe something needs, gears need to replace and so forth. Um, drive belts, um, machine structures, rolling element bearings, you can specifically look at the inner race, outer race and rolling elements to give you very early indications of bearing wear and plan to have a piece of equipment rebuilt before it damages itself where there's many more components such as replacing shafts or housings necessary. And then there's the broadband type measurements which look at fatigue, impacts, and friction. And so this is a model which could be created for a specific machine and calculated continuously in real time in hundreds of milliseconds directly at the edge at the machine and actionable information then transmitted. Your machine has an unbalanced situation. Your machine has a winding in, um, issue. This is the power of using vibration monitoring and edge calculation to automate maintenance within today's production facilities. The big thing that is different from a standpoint of using vibration measurements from most other sensing principles is because most things are what's called time-based, right? Time domain, time-based. If I have a pressure sensor, I get a measurement, I get a measurement, I get a measurement, and I use those directly. That's not how the technology of vibration measurements work. And this is the point which is confusing to many people. The way vibration measurements work is I have my time-based system. I take a sample of that, which is the composite of everything going on in that machine. And I have to apply high-level math to it. It's called a fast Fourier transform. And then I have a data set of the individual frequencies which can be extracted from that. And this process is quite large in the amount of data to create 
those specific frequencies, you need to collect 25,000 time domain data points per second, and you usually need to collect those for 10 or 20 seconds in order to have a sample set to do the high-level math to be able to get the result to extract those specific frequencies, such as the rotational speed from. If you try to do this at a central computing device and stream all that data, it's overwhelming to the architecture of a network. And so that's really the fundamental reason behind vibration measurement and the necessity to do it at the edge, to be able to do all of that high speed data analysis to be able to extract root cause information. And so everything that we've talked about so far has been about the machine, the measurements on the machine, and the root cause information that you can get from it. The other half of the puzzle of real-time maintenance is the integration aspect. And here, a vibration measurement system has to be very flexible to adapt into the architecture of the control system. And so you need to be able to, if necessary, communicate directly to a PLC to transfer information to a SCADA system, let's say. But in some instances, you might need to communicate directly to the SCADA system. And in other instances, you might need to be communicating through an Ethernet network to some kind of gateway going to some kind of analytics platform. And so key with vibration measurement systems for real-time maintenance is the flexibility in the integration portion, the other half, the measurement portion is on one side, but getting the information data to where it needs to go in the easiest methodology is a big portion of any real-time maintenance and um, integration project. And then once the information gets to where it needs to go, you need to be able to, um, to utilize it, to evaluate it, to automate your processes, to be able to generate reports, to be able to see trends. There needs to be a software tool. And from IFM, we offer our freeware, which does exactly that. You're able to configure and build those kinematic models. You're able to um, take and convert the raw signal. You can analyze the time waveform. You can analyze the spectrum, both automatically and um, manually. Um, you can extract trend history from each of the edge controllers. And so all of these now en enable a maintenance department to be able to not only automate, but to be able to visualize and act upon and determine root cause and what's necessary to keep that machine in top running condition. And so that's a, a, a little bit about how IFM is trying to help industry to um, bring real-time maintenance and to bring the technology of vibration monitoring to people in an easy packaged way to really get um, results and actionable information um, in real time to help keep manufacturing equipment in good operating condition, to not affect your machine availability, to improve the performance of it. And ultimately, those two things make sure that the quality of the of the product you're making is consistent and um, where you want it to be. So Sean, thank you. This is um, um, IFM's ideas and strategies of real-time maintenance. And I hope that your audience um, enjoys this uh, podcast. And if there's um, any type of questions or um, yeah, if you're interested in doing something, um, feel free to reach out to, to myself. Bob, I really appreciate you doing this presentation. I had a question. I think that, uh, you know, most of the viewers and listeners we have at the automation blog are very familiar with PLCs, you know, industrial communication protocols, whether they be Profinet or Ethernet IP or, or Modbus TCP. And, um, you know, data collection, SCADA systems and whatnot. And I think one of the things, having sat through the presentation 
with you and, and, and considering the, the pre-show uh, conversations we had um, is, you know, what would somebody need to do to deploy one of your edge devices? In other words, you know, uh, getting the accelerometer on, on the, the system, that's one piece. But when they go to open your catalog, and you know, and you you mentioned you had freeware software, but I'm I'm interested in two things. Is is there one multi-purpose edge device that you have for your real-time maintenance? Is it just one catalog number? And then the second question would be, what's involved with setting that up? Is do they need to take some uh, training on your freeware? to actually configure the device or would they hire you to do that? So do, I don't know if you see where my two questions are going, but yep. one's hardware yep. based and then one's like deployment. Well, what's involved with that? Yep. So um, there are several different part numbers for our edge controllers based upon the functionality. So there's a different part number for an ethernet IP versus a Profinet or Modbus. We have some that, don't have any industrial communication, only the um, typical PC, Ethernet, TCP, IP. We have others which have programmable switching I.O. so that you can do traditional I.O. handshaking for coordination. So there's a bunch of different flavors. Um, but they all have the same capabilities as far as the accelerometers are concerned? Or the yes. different... Okay. Yep, so they, they all have the same basic capabilities to be able to be programmed to isolate um, specific frequencies of interest or ranges of in different measure, uh, units of measure and conditioned in different ways, such as peak or average value. And they all have the ability to take a variety of different accelerometers or sensors into them um, to do the analysis on. So that functionality, regardless of the communication methodologies, is always the same. So really, the part numbers real specify, I mean, it's kind of like a PLC in a way, it's specifying I.O. options and communication options, yes. whereas the so, accelerometer side is kind of common among all of those models. Correct, yes. So um, as an example, one of our most popular accelerometers is what we call a VSA001. This is the typical industrial machine accelerometer that connects to the edge controller. Um, we have the VSE15X, so a 150 would be an Ethernet, I, um, a Profinet, a 152 is an Ethernet. Um, and so those two different part numbers along with the associated cables would build up a system. Then the other half of the question that you had asked is with the configuration programming, how do I get my um, information where I need to go? Um, if I get, let's say, a Ethernet IP version, right? I configure it and I can get then my output table um, for what the IO values are to import into my PLC, right? Um, we also support on the Ethernet TCP IP side with a software developer kit, which gives you APIs, which allows you to integrate functionality directly into your own application. Many applications um, for um, various different um, SCADA platforms, and so we'll have hooks in directly for that. Um, also, when, um, let's say, an OEM is building their machine um, and they're using their own controls, let's say it's a Linux platform with an HMI, we can support them to be able to operate the edge controllers directly in their, um, their application, their machine controls. So it's not switching to IFM's freeware and then back to the machine controls. So there's different layers and levels of integration. IFM, um, our concept is that we want you to um, own the technology and we are here to support you to be able to um, understand the product, how it works. We have our tech support. We have our field engineers. Um, we can give free training all the way up to doing the complete engineering design programming 
um, as a solution for you. Um, so we're very flexible in how we work to cover that gap of understanding, absorbing the technology and applying it. You know, I was very impressed when we had our initial discussions about the, the, the price of these units. I guess my only remaining question is, out of the box, out of the box, right, aside from the basic configuration, IP address, whatever, um, do I need to teach it? Uh, do I need to use that freeware software to actually configure it and teach it, you know, beyond like, hey, this is the accelerometer plugged in, this is my IP address, you know, monitor vibration and tell me if I have a problem. Is there some kind of, is there a process you have to go through to teach it about your machine? So, um, as we talked about different levels of devices and different types of machines, the edge controller can be very easily configured to look at some broadband monitoring. That takes no knowledge at all. And in fact, we have some templates available which you can more or less just click and um, install. When you start wanting to get more precise root cause information, you have to be able to input the measurements based on the kinematics of the machine. So a great example of that is if my machine has a rolling element bearing of a 6062 um, DIN code, right? And now I want to specifically monitor the frequency of that bearing. You would need to be able to configure that. And we help you to do that because we have a library of over 10,000 bearings in our freeware software. So it's nothing more than saying, here's my bearing number, um, click on that, and the settings are automatically made in the background for the monitoring of that bearing. And so there's some work to be done, um, a heck of a lot less than, let's say, creating your own PLC programming for a machine, but there is some um, configuration to be able to zero more and more in on a specific machine's root causes from the kinematics. Excellent. That really does uh, a good job of answering my question, and I appreciate that. And I, I can, I have used the uh, conditioning monitoring systems that integrate to a PLC, and it's, it's, uh, it can be a, a bit of configuration and 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 uh, uh, you know, um, quite a bit of work to do that. So it sounds like you guys have a definitely have. Um, an excellent solution here compared to what I've used in the past anyways. But Bob, I really appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions and taking the time to give us this overview and uh, coming on the automation podcast. Yeah, Sean, thanks for having me. It's been great. And I hope that your, uh, your viewers and listeners um, get a little bit understanding about uh, real time maintenance and how to apply it. And um, yeah, uh, IFM is here to help, help you and, and, and help our, um, companies and manufacturing companies to be able to be more competitive. Yeah, great. That's that's awesome. And again, thank you. And uh, to everybody listening, as we do with every show, all the links uh, Bob is providing us will be in the description. So if you want to go find out more about uh, about this topic or this product, you can just scroll down and click on those in the description. Um, Bob, thanks again. Hey, have a great week. Okay, Sean. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that presentation, and I want to thank Bob again for coming on the show and giving us that overview. If you did enjoy the show, please remember to give us a like and a sub. And with that, I want to wish you all a very happy, safe, and healthy week. And until next time, my friends, peace.